All right, everyone, welcome to the STOA. Uh, today's session is called Deep Fitness, and uh, we are company today with uh, Philip Shepard and Andre uh, Yakovenko. Um, and Philip and Andre are co authors of a book called Deep Fitness. Uh, the mindful science-based strength training method to transform your well-being in just 30 minutes a week. What a subtitle there. How could you not want to <laughs> uh, engage in that? And um, yeah, this is really cool because it's combining uh, strength training and high-intensity training with embodiment work. And uh, people at the STOA know that uh, we're big into uh, embodiment, so we'd love to learn more about this process. Um, how today is going to work? Uh, Andre, Philip, and myself, we're going to engage in a conversation for 15, 20 minutes, and uh, then we'll pivot to Q&A. So if you have questions anytime, uh, even if you just have some coming in, put in the chat, I'll call on you, you can unmute yourself, ask your question to uh, Philip and Andre. And if you don't want to be on YouTube, uh, I can read your question on your behalf. Um, so that being said, uh, Philip, Andre, welcome to the, the STOA. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be. It's, it's um, you know, STOA. The STOA name um, resonates deeply for me, so it's a double pleasure to be here with you. Beautiful. Yeah. Um, so perhaps we can start with, uh, like, what is deep fitness? What is mindful strength training to failure, like a high-level mm -hmm. uh, overview? Um, and perhaps how you two got together to create this thing? Um, I, could, I could start. What is deep fitness? Um, for many, many years, our understanding of fitness was shaped by a book that came out in 1968, a book I remember well, um, called Aerobics. And it, it introduced the word. The word aerobics didn't exist. And the guy who wrote it was Kenneth Cooper, a very highly respected medical doctor and um, trainer of NASA astronauts. And he put forth the contention that fitness was basically about your ability to metabolize oxygen. So he said that the, what you're doing is you are conditioning your heart and your lungs. That's the purpose of fitness. And so he went on to say that the most important fitness was aerobic fitness and that Building muscle, in his view, wasn't just kind of unnecessary, but it was a liability because it would put more strain on the heart and the lungs. Um, and we, you know, as a culture, we embraced this message. You know, his book sold over 30 million copies, just to give you some sense of the scale of this. And, and the jogging craze started and the running and all that. And, and our understanding of what fitness is, is, is 50 years old. Basically, it doesn't take into account the research that has been done since there. So every one of the major contentions put forward by Cooper has been overturned, has been disproven. Fitness isn't about conditioning the heart and the lungs. Um, the whole body adapts to fitness. Um, and muscle, rather than being, you know, a liability, um, turns out to be the bedrock of fitness. And this was this was discovered um, just early in this century for the first time. There are these messenger molecules called myokines that are generated when muscle works. The more intensely muscle works, the more myokines are made, the stronger a muscle is, the more myokines are made. And myokines have been understood to be the elusive X factor, the, the, the something that exercise does for the body that promotes health in every department. So myokines affect brain health, they affect bone mineral density, they affect um, oxygen uptake, they affect everything. There are over 600 different myokines that have been discovered and we're still learning about the effect uh, that they have on the body. So deep fitness is about um, this science-based um, understanding of fitness combined with Another, another sort of cultural 
paradigm we've fallen into with fitness, which is I have to make my body do this for its own good. So, you know, we do the exercise and we set up our heads and we say, oh, keep going, keep going. And it's like sitting on a donkey, beating it with a stick to go harder. And it's just injurious, you know, over the long run to such an extent that who who keeps up an exercise regime apart from, you know, the most devoted um, fans of it. So, so there is a way of dropping into your body and allowing the body to engage so that the whole of your being is present to what is happening. And, and uh, Deep Fitness um, proposes MSTF, Mindful Strength Training to Failure. And so the practices are, are slow. You're not, you're not moving anything fast. That has a huge effect on the incidence of injury because there's no forceful impulse that, that can do damage. So it's very slow. It's very mindful and massively effective. It turns out that when you move a weight slowly, the, the muscles um, are stimulated to grow stronger and when you take that to failure and by failure we just mean you're pushing the weight until you can't you can't even hold it and then you let it down as slowly as you can there's a cascade of beneficial effects so you get stronger faster with this balance between this intense workout and then the necessary recovery time Andre, I don't know if you have anything else to kick in. You're muted, Andre. Can you can you unmute? I think you summed it well, Philip. Um, <laughs> you know, I don't know what else to add in that regards. But in terms of um, kind of our background and the story, we have this um, place. We have a couple locations uh, in downtown Toronto. Uh, we we call it New Element Training. Uh, there's one facility near St. Dundas and one just actually north of U of T near uh, St. George subway station. And we've been um, practicing this training for over eight and a half years now. And, you know, at some point a few years back, I thought this training is so effective, you know, it really transforms so many lives. And I know it because I see it with our own eyes. There's one thing you read it, sign, you know, scientific papers. Another thing you see the transformation with your own eyes, how it changes people's lives for better. And our specialty is, you know, people kind of 40 plus, right? That's kind of where we're beginning to lose muscle. And once people get in that age group and above, they've noticed how it affects their quality of life. And once we rebuild the muscle and people, you know, coming back and tell us story after story is how it transformed their lives. And I thought I should figure out how to take this concept and, um, and, you know, take it outside of the wall of New Element Training. And I thought about, well, one thing to do is write a book. And sitting on this project for several years, at that time, I got into mindfulness. Um, you know, a, a friend of mine referred me to Philip. I invited him to try the workout. And, you know, the, the rest is the history. At some point, I asked him, hey, Philip, do you want to do this project with me? And he agreed right away. And it took us a couple of years. And uh, we wrote Deep Fitness, which is kind of, what we've learned is very experiential, very evidence-based, very empirical uh, kind of book based on what we see day to day in our facilities at New Element Training. Uh, and it's all backed up by research. And I thought, you know, it's kind of time to put it all together. And Philip is uh, an expert, really true, true expert in, in embodied mindfulness. And given that aspect to you know, our book, which made it the book even so more unique. So that's kind of... Of, uh, you know, quick summary, I guess. And the thing that's coming up for me is um, like the, I guess, why I, I reached out to you two and why I got excited about this this book. Because um, when I'm, I'm 30, what am I, 37 now? And when I was, uh, you know, younger, when I was working out a lot, like lifting weights and doing kettlebells and stuff, it's like kind of like that dude bro culture, like just crush it and just like, you know, just go crazy. Um, which led to like kind of injuries and stuff like that and it was sort of like at the core of it there was like 
shame you know just like shame about this body and then not like looking good enough or whatever and just wanting to have superficial motivations and that doesn't inspire me anymore and so it's like my whole motivational schema of working out in the past is just like boom like done and um i'm trying to work out again uh um now and then just trying to find a new way to kind of like love and respect this body and then nourish it and work out right um and you, you talk a lot about embodiment and disembodiment philip and like my previous approach was very disembodied. And when I look at some like workout regimens and stuff, it's like they almost smuggle in those scripts that are kind of like not in a uh, holistic service to this thing. Um, so I'm, I'm curious uh, about this sort of like a shift in motivation of why even work out um, that this process uh, advocates. Yeah, I mean, it's hard. <clears throat> it's hard to identify an external reason for working out i've i've sort of worked out all my life um um just because i i i, I want to feel like an athlete um and what's 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 missing from this conversation what's impossible to convey is the experience of this workout that's what keeps me coming back. I mean, the first time, you know, Andre invited me in, I, 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 you know, have a mutual friend, would you like to try the workout? And I went into new element training. I was more alive doing that slow, mindful workout than I'd been in weeks. And that aliveness, you know, I'm, I'm 69 and, 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 you know, I'd, I, I guard against um, the cultural messaging that, that says, uh, you know, as you get old, you get weaker and, and you're going to break things and hurt. But even so, I, I had internalized, oh, you know, maybe, you know, you shouldn't go uh, quite as intensely as, as you used to. And there I was uh, at Andre's going to failure i mean this moment of failure is a realm in which you have this deep encounter with the self it is a, a an encounter that i don't get anywhere else in my life and it's a fully embodied mindful accepting joyous moment that 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 failure and so my body yearns for that aliveness. I can't wait, you know, to go into the gym for, for my next workout. Um, and, and it's really contrary to the, the sort of shame, the punitive, the, the I should do this uh, mentality that we tend to bring into the realm of of fitness so i mean the other things that keep me going are are i i've had aches and pains you know you get your hips a little sore and it goes on for a couple of years or this or that and they've all gone i no longer have them because my muscles are coming into balance and there's this principle um that we talk about in the book of biotensegrity and and that's the way the body works it's not like a a machine you know you think of a robot where the weight of the robot is is all taken down through the metal parts you know in the body there's this this network of fascia and muscles so the joints are floating more than resting on each other and and that floating is held in place by a balanced muscle system so you know i i've i'm i'm no longer you know, subject to those aches and pains, I have more vitality than I had. My thinking is clear, um, and all that just feels good. So, so it's 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 an internal embodied desire to go back, to go back, to go back. Um, I should also add before uh, you know we continue is that this style of training, which we call MSTF. Uh, you only do it a couple times a week, maybe even once a week, and typically it doesn't last more than 30 minutes. 
which this time efficiency of it. And it's, it's not just we made it you know, more convenient for people because everybody, you know, just short on time. It's actually more optimal when you understand the science of it. And that's kind of probably the, one of the most important and, you know, attributes of this training, why people still coming back to it is that you can still have a busy life. You can still do things that you love, play tennis, you know, play sports, do whatever you want to do, maintain your active lifestyle. And the actual exercise gym time, uh, it's no more than 30 minutes once or twice a week, which is not the only way to exercise, but if you prioritize your time, uh, you know, as Philip mentioned, uh, safety, and you want to do something that's efficient, effective in a way that will strengthen your joints, not compromise them, it's pro and experience a bit of mindful embodiment. Uh, it's one of the best way we know to do this. Awesome. <clears throat> Very cool. Um, and, and I really like that, that working out for the sense of uh, aliveness. Um, I think that is sort of my lived conclusion the last couple of years. Uh, so we have a bunch of great questions in the chat. Um, Kim, would you like to ask your question? Yeah, um, thanks for this. This is like awesome and awesome to have it on the stove. I mean, I just, just ah, this is my world. Um, mm. I've been working out and lifting weights since I was 12 years old. And I have that same like, oh my God, that sense of just being so in tune with just a specific move and just feeling it throughout the whatever it is. So thank you for that. Um, I'd really, and it looks like some other people too, would like um, just a little more detail. My question was, uh, are you targeting a certain, I can probably look this up too and read the book, but uh, are you targeting certain um, uh, uh, muscle groups because it's only 30 minutes are you working with certain lighter weights or heavier weights, reps? You know, just some of those details might be helpful. Well, let, let me jump in if, if I could, because I can give a very short answer and then Andre can elaborate. When you're working out, the target isn't weight, it's time. So what you want to do is move a weight that will bring you to failure somewhere between one and a half and two minutes. And if you go longer, increase the weight. If it's shorter, decrease the weight. So, and you don't do another set. It's not that you do do three sets of reps, one set to failure. Um, the other part of the question you asked um, had to do with targeting muscle groups. You can, in, in 30 minutes, bring all the major muscle groups of the body to failure. With, um, with different practices. And so it depends of uh, if you, I would say maybe half of our clients, they prefer once a week. So in that case, you know, we make sure that we have this, you know, we call the essential six foundational exercises, just simple compound movements, leg press, seated throw, chest press, pull down, shoulder press, core. Uh, those ones typically will cover all the major muscles, as Philip mentioned, and then we kind of fill in in between. Because when you train to failure, typically you'll be on any given exercise, maybe give or take a couple of minutes. Um, you can go through, you know, full body workout, roughly up to 10 exercises, covering all the major muscles and also filling in between, uh, because some people have different needs, different issues need to work on. The benefit of the main benefit of the second workout, it's not that those major muscles really need another stimulus. You know, once a week to failure is kind of, is good enough. But the second workout allows us to cover the rest of the body. So we want, might do another full body workout, uh, targeting the muscles uh, from different angles during different exercises, or allows us to work more on, you know, isolating very specific muscles. Lots of people have issues with rotator cuff, lower back, you know, hips and so on. So it could be more, a little bit more precise. Uh, and that way, so while doing twice a week, you pretty much covered uh, all the areas of your musculoskeletal needs. Um, did that answer your question, more or less? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it sounds like there's details to be caught up on. So I'll just I'll just throw out one more minor or one more question, um, which is, uh, you know, it used to be I used to do you know aerobics, stretching, and weightlifting. You know, all my life. Um, mm -hmm. And then 
you know, a number of years ago is, oh my God, I'm missing some minor muscles. <laughs> like, you know, it's getting older. It's like, oh, got to put those in there too. And that's kind of a separate type of workout, you know, Pilates or whatever. And I'm just wondering whether you find that it's important to uh, include or that they are naturally included in this type of workout, the more minor, you know, minor muscles yeah. that we tend not to uh, do in weightlifting. I think so. Oh, it's sorry. almost needs to be done. Sep almost needs to be done separately. Like it's, it's still same workout session, but you know, we, when we meet with clients, we identify those weakened areas and we, you know, at the new element training, we're using this equipment called MEDEX, which stands for medical exercise. Essentially, it's a medical grade equipment, the best in the world as far as we're concerned. You won't find better machines than this. And they allow us to precisely isolate those weakened gluteus minimus, you know, the rotator cuff muscles, the deep erectors of the lower back, and so on and so forth. So then your session, it depends again if you come once or twice a week. The main goal is to target the larger muscles, but then, you know, we, we identify for each client their needs, and then we make sure that we also isolate in those small ones. And there might not be necessarily to fail our, you know, our approach might change it a bit. Make sure we activate those muscles, because if you're not activating those muscles, we're not feeling those muscles, other muscles take over. And those the ones, they kind of will remain dormant. We need to reactivate them by, you know, various means so, so it's kind of building into into your workout routine i i i should just uh add to what andre's saying the machines at his gym take take you through the full range of motion for for any compound exercise or the, um and so the you know the the layers I can feel, you know, as I'm going through it, layers of muscles kind of coming online and, and other muscles. It's a, it, it's the, the machines make a huge difference. I've, I travel the world teaching workshops and where I go, I, you know, try to find a gym so I can get in my workout and, and, you know, I've had firsthand experience with most brands of gym equipment that's made and there's, there's nothing like the Medex equipment. Thank you, Kim. Uh, Julian, uh, I think you had uh, some follow-up questions on that. Sure. Thanks, Peter. Um, I think I've kind of gotten the answer to the first one, but my uh, um, curiosity is if there's an isometric component to the um, exercise or if the goal is to like stretch the movement out over the course of the full minute and a half to two minutes so that you're never static in one position. Um, um, yes and no, where basically there are three phases in st of strength. There is what we call concentric, we just call it positive when you contract the muscle, like the, the lifting portion. There is the isometric, as you just made, with a static hold when you hold the muscle statically. And then the eccentric or, or you know, the, the lengthening of the muscle, the lowering portion. And they all uh, actually have different degrees of strength. So we're strongest on the eccentric, on the negative, weakest on the concentric, on the positive, and somewhere in the middle and isometric. So the way we do our training is, uh, let's say you're doing a chest press, right? You move slowly and mindfully. It typically takes you five to 10 seconds to reach top of the range of motion. And what we're gonna do, we're gonna squeeze the muscle for a second or two. And then mm -hmm. we're gonna bring it down, same slow cadence, and then pause before the plate starts. So then the muscle remains under continuous tension. The importance of this one second pauses is you break any momentum. And then, you know, when you approach that state of failure, you might be failing on the positive phase, but you can use stronger on this isometric static phase. So yeah, we might hold, it depends on the exercise, isometric for as long as possible, could be 10, 15, how many seconds. And then mm -hmm. once the muscle cannot hold that anymore, you fail on that phase as well, then you slowly lower it and you fail on the strongest of the phases of the negative phase. So by the end of your set, you went through all the three phases and you fail on the strongest of the phases. So there is isometric component, but, and you can, there's ways to just, train muscles isometrically. Um, but, you know, at element training, it's kind of just one of these tools in the toolbox. It's there, but we, we use other methodologies, not, not only, we could use isometric, but it's generally kind of built in mm -hmm. into the workout. Awesome, yeah, that's, uh, that's really good. And then um, 
Uh, I was curious, just since the um, acceleration and deceleration is very slow, right? Mm -hmm. um, how does that uh, translate into athletic performance when you're looking for sort of speed, agility, or uh, acceleration, yeah. those kinds of things? So, so what's going on in terms of muscles essentially made of three types of fibers, right? There are the steady state uh, fibers, so-called slow twitch. So those one takes like 90 seconds to recover and then they're back into the loop. Uh, then there's intermediate twitch fibers for somewhat more intense work. And there's those fast twitch fibers, you know, that's what you're talking about, that acceleration. So what's going on is the brain recruits those muscle fibers sequentially. It always starts, always, always, always with the lowest order fibers. So with the slow twitch, depending on the resistance you choose. So typically if you choose resistance that you're gonna approach failure, let's say around 90 seconds or so, you know, the first rep or two, you may be, you know, it's not that intensive yet. So the brain is, okay, it can do the work using those slow twitch fibers. And then it's going to sequentially tap into the intermediate twitch fibers. And then what's going to happen at the end of the set, you're going to feel somewhat agitated. So what's going on, actually, that's the key of this exercise. As far as we're concerned, that's where we want to take you. Prior to that, it's just to take you to that state. Your brain, the intensive, the intensive muscle contraction is so high now that your brain thinks, well, this is a life-threatening emergency. So what's going to do is going to start producing adrenaline. And that adrenaline, the purpose of it essentially is to make you agitated so you can be present and deal with the situation. But also what happens when you produce adrenaline, you activate this fight and flight, you're going to start tapping into those fast switch, you know, explosive muscle fibers. But the thing is, you're going to be so exhausted by that stage, your brain, you're going to try to go all out as hard as you can, as fast as you can, but you won't be able to generate much force. Why? Because the muscles are exhausted. So it's a very, it's the safest way to activate those fast switch motor units and to stimulate them with minimum risk of injury because injury typically happen when it's a high explosive movement, right? That's usually when you hurt yourself, when external force exceeds internal integrity of the structure and forces must some acceleration. So by removing the acceleration and just like try to go, it's uh, one of the safest way to go through that, you know, all the three types of those fast switch motor units that are responsible for those explosive all out um, effort. And there have been, you know, studies, for example, the, the classic one from around 75 uh, at West Point Military Academy in the States where they, uh, back in the Nautilus days, uh, the predecessor to Medex, there was company still is called Nautilus and they sell the, sold their machines to West Point Military Academy and they trained their varsity football players. Uh, so half a group did, you know, more conventional, unsupervised weightlifting, you know, sprinting a couple of miles. Another group did uh, the Nautilus kind of high intensity one set to failure training three times a week. The Nautilus group, despite the fact they didn't do anything else, they outperformed the control group on 60 markets of aerobic fitness. They increased in strength by, I don't know if you remember, something around 50%. And those already strong football players to begin with. And they also improve in flexibility by, I think, on average, 11% or so. So this training and in, in, in the paper that they published uh, uh, from that experiment, they call total conditioning study. So it really encapsulates all the positive adaptations somebody would achieve from exercise. You get a total conditioning effect. Your heart, everything gets stimulated and, and gets stronger. I know it's a long answer, but... <laughs> no, that's, that's brilliant. I really appreciate that, actually. I can totally relate to... Um, yeah. injury always being associated with trying to, you know, muscle out one extra rep or try to increase yeah. the speed exactly. or the uh, explosiveness. And the idea that you can tap into that ability without having the risk is, that's a phenomenal insight. So thanks for sharing. I'd love to, I'd love to add one thing if I could, because Andre is talking about the, the different kinds of muscle fiber, <clears throat> the fast twitch mu muscle fiber, as he said, only you only engage those muscles when the other two types of fiber can no longer do the work that's being asked of them the fast twitch muscles are the largest strongest muscles in our bodies and there is a condition called sarcopenia which is the wasting of muscle as we grow older it just tends to happen and as you lose muscle mass you are losing the ability to support the body through the production of myokines. And the fast twitch muscles, unless you're going to failure, 
they don't engage. So, I mean, you can, you can walk five miles a day and still you're losing muscle mass because you're never placing that demand on your largest, strongest muscles. So that's another benefit of this form of exercise is the larger, the largest of your muscles are being stimulated to get stronger. Cool. Thanks, uh, Julian. Um, Kevin, you had a few questions in the chat. Uh, <clears throat> hey, guys. This has already been very interesting. I feel like I don't know enough about how muscles work already. Um, <clears throat> I have a question about different types of exercise. You suggest doing this in a, um, like a weight training context. I'm wondering how these principles could be applied to sort of different intentional uh, workout things like, for example, body weight training or like, you know, yoga seems like a very different practice, like very intentional practice, but there's not much weight or like maybe gymnastics training. Um, I'm wondering if you could touch on like some practical ways to kind of get the um, mindful strength training principles in these other kind of disciplines. Yeah, I mean, what... Um one thing I might I might just show you the book um, in answer to your question because it has it has exercises in it and there's a whole section um, that is body weight exercises so so it's not that you need a gym to take advantage of the of the method there are more body weight exercises in the book than there are exercises with machines. Um, Andre, I know you've got yeah, uh, and so when we look at the use machines or free weights or body weight or elastic bands, all the other just tools, tools, you know, you get different results. And this workout is effective in terms of this metabolic effect and strengthening effect using your body weight as you know using high quality machines that fits at Newman training even though you know we have our little bias towards our machines of course but it's still effective since COVID started we've been training people virtually and still do for you know a couple of years now and since books been released now we have clients all over uh, the world actually and you know some people say after these sessions they impress how they feel soreness for several days using just mostly body weights in terms of applying it in other areas like yoga and other, you know, uh, just, you know, once you go through the book, you will see there is this mindful component. Just try to feel the muscles that you're, you know, working, engaging. And, you know, in our case, we would go get those muscles to, to state of failure, to produce the stimulus or adaptation. So, you know, it is basically context dependent. You know, sometimes depending on what you're doing, it might be safe, might not be safe. So you kind of have to... Um, uh, you know, be careful. Uh, but the key, I would say, just when you're doing some sort of movement-based, you know, activity, be mindful, but, um, you know, be careful you don't hurt yourself. Yeah, thank you. And a kind of related question is, um, and you already mentioned like th the three different, you can have failure in the three different types. Um, but I'm curious, like, you know, what actually like failure means from like a, because so for example, like I've been like practicing doing headstands and that's like very balance, balance oriented, but also I feel like mm -hmm. there's a lot of balancing, like, you know, like kind of like a feedback system where like if you were, you know, doing dumbbell presses, it's like they can fall to either side. Like, well, like what does failure mean? Because uh, yeah, because it seems like there's so many different muscles that could fail. Is it about sort of identifying uh, weak points and is that part of the mindfulness like feeling like which muscles are failing and then like do you guys have like are you able to like like you know put your own self to failure and then like identify like oh like this part needs work here um so the definition of fa muscle failure in our context is uh, a last repetition that you unable to complete while keeping a good form so you have to be you have to have a clear intention which muscles you try to target to make sure the form is good, right? And then while keeping a strict form, slow mindful movement, eventually gravity is going to win. It's just a matter of time. <laughs> and you, without breaking the form, keeping a perfect form, feeling those right muscles, you're going to get to the point where despite your absolutely best effort, 
we simply won't be able to generate enough force to produce the movement. So this is we call muscle failure. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Kevin. Um, Eloy, you had a, a few questions. Uh, yeah, mostly, thanks. Yeah, thanks, guys. Mostly related to the the mindfulness and the focus. So I was wondering if there's a relationship between this the slow movement and breath work, and also wh where is the mind focused during this the movement? Is it on the the movement itself, or the muscles being activated, or the whole experience of it? And um, also. Are there mindfulness benefits from doing this that are different from other mindfulness practices? And I just, I wanna give a little context that I um, came to mindfulness in, in fitness through uh, Rob McNamara's book called Strength to Awaken. Mm. And um, that was very powerful. Like I used to, I used to work out in the gym all the time and the, the, the trainers would always count down like you got five more, four more. And I was always you know, focused on that when, when I get to the end. And after reading that book, I was like, don't tell me where I'm at. Just tell me when I'm done, you know? <clears throat> and then I could focus on each rep, you know, like yeah. each, yeah. So. Yeah. So um, I'll, let me, let me, um, let me tell you what's coming up for me. You know, breath, breath is absolutely uh, an essential part of this. How can there be mindfulness without breath? Um, and, you know, I've got one, I don't think there's a right way to breathe. You know, every breath is a response to the present, ideally, and the present moment is is new with each breath. But there's a principle that we abide by, which is that the whole of the body can be available to every breath. And that's a very, that's a very specific feeling when, when you can feel, you know, the the body is essentially a fluid medium. We're 65% water at least. So every breath initiates a wave through the body's fluidity. And that wave can travel to the bottom of the feet, to the top of the head, to the tips of your fingers. And the center of that breath wave um, is considered to be the pelvic bowl or the pelvic floor. So the pelvic floor is a diaphragm in the body, just as the thoracic diaphragm is a diaphragm. And if the pelvic floor releases to the breath, the thoracic diaphragm will release. But generally what happens is we hold the pelvic floor in tension and the thoracic diaphragm is pumping above it and it's just braced against it. So to access breath by a release of the pelvic floor offers an invitation to the whole of the body to release to the breath as well when that happens the the work is done always on the out breath and especially the the protocol i'm doing now is is lowering a weight for 30 seconds lifting it over 30 seconds and lowering it for 30 seconds. Um, it, it's just one that I love that Andre introduced me to. And as I'm approaching failure and I'm trying to lift the weight, I'm doing it on the outbreath just incrementally, on each outbreath just a little bit more. Um, and the connection, you know, where is the focus, you asked? Um, there is a very clear focus between my perineum, which is the, the center of the pelvic floor, and the weight I'm pushing. It's almost as though one were in touch with the other. And then the breath is almost like a piston where I can feel it's you know, in deep in the pelvic bowl, the breath is like a is it's like a fist closing on on the work. This this strength there, and and it's so though as though the breath itself were moving the weight when when that's happening. Wow! Oh, thank you. Yeah, 
Wonderful question. Thank you. Uh, Philip discusses it in more details in chapter six for those who are interested. It's quite amazing. Uh, very original work. If anything, you know, if you're into mindfulness, just read chapters. <laughs> Forget about the rest. <laughs> Thanks, Eloy. Um, John, you had a, a question. Yeah. Um, it was somewhat addressed already in earlier, but I kind of have it a little bit more revised and I'm curious about your view on complementary programs or workouts for people that may want to tailor some of their activities to just emulating like an explosive movement, such as jumping, or if you're doing rock climbing and you wanna just move into like working with the momentum of your body. Um, what's your views on that? And is there room for some, for an explosive kind of movement? Or do you find that the, the slow, mindful strength training exercises can encompass such things? So, okay, Philip, you wanna do it then? Well, just, so. just a little, um, I mean, I, I play tennis, I ride my bike. Um, there's, a, there's a high intensity interval training that I do once a week. It takes me nine and a half minutes and I'm all out on a rowing machine. Now I don't any longer sprint running. I don't I don't do interval training sprinting. My you know my body no I'd rather not do that. But the row is is sufficiently controlled um, that I can do that without risk of injury. So there's nothing I don't do as well as my weekly workout. And, you know, there's this saying that I heard once that made a lot of sense to me. You don't, you don't play tennis to get fit. You get fit to play tennis. And that makes a whole lot of sense to me. Um, on Andre? Um, so as far as, you know, practicing these fast explosive movements, yes, when you're younger, you, you know, you're going to get away with it. But you know, ask us this question, you know, let's say you're going to be 80 years of age. What kind of joints you would like to have at that age? Well, you know, the rock climbing, whatever, I don't know if you can do it at 80, but enjoy life and be, be active. Or you want to, you know, have a chance of risk of heavy weapons. So then what you want to think, you want to review from that question, you want to reverse engineer your workout today and try to work out in such style that would put the least impact on the joints. And we know in physics, force to smash some acceleration, as I mentioned earlier. So slow down the acceleration is <laughs> way more sustainable, not in the short term, you know, avoiding the acute uh, injury, but also in the long term, you go, you're gonna put much, much, much less strain on your joints uh, in the long term as well. So you're gonna have healthier joints at you know, more advanced age. You know, I, I know when you're like 20s, 30s, you're going to live forever. Who cares? Uh, it's fine. If that's what you like doing and you're willing to take those risks, you know, by all means. You know, but uh, I, I wouldn't do it. I would just, you know, if you play sports and stuff, you know, just this is the risk you're willing to take. But if you care about long-term uh, health of your joints, uh, I would avoid explosive moments. Cool, thanks. Um, Stephen, you had a, a question. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I think you partially answered it. My question was about uh, other activities you would suggest on the off days. Um, I guess you already mentioned like a hit type workout, but if there's anything else that you guys suggest. Um, what I'm what I might say is, we don't recommend you do this workout once a week and lie on the couch the rest of the week. Um, the body needs to move and, and you know, whatever you enjoy, you know, if it's walking or gardening, I mean, all, all of this helps the body's health. Um, it doesn't, it doesn't build muscle strength as the training does, but okay, that you train once or twice a week and you've covered that and, 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 we're made to move. So I, I would just say in general, you know, I go cross country skiing in the winter. I, you know, I, I, I ride my bike. I, I'm, 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 
I'm a writer, so I have to um, guard against sitting all day still, you know, writing away. Um, I need to get outside and move around, dance, whatever. Andre, do you? Well, kind of, yeah, I just feel upset. Um, do something you love doing, you enjoy doing. I uh, Kind of similar to Philip, you know, since I own your training, I'm here pretty much every day. I do this training like everybody else, 30 minutes, a couple of times a week. And then recently I signed up to this community center near my house. I kind of live far from my gyms. And I, you know, doing a form of high intense interval training. I go to sauna, just, you know, it feels great. It's good for heart, it's good for all those reasons. And then for me, I'm, I'm just on my feet most of the day, so I kind of get my movement that way. So we know that movement is important and, you know, just get those equivalent of 10,000 steps or more every day in whichever, you know, form or shape it takes. Any follow-up, uh, share question, Stephen? Uh, no, that's good. Thanks. All right. Um, so this might be your last question. Uh, Luke, you had a, a question or two. Hear me okay? Yep. Cool. Um, I have two questions. One, just a clarification. I've, I've done some high intensity training, so not high intensity interval training, but HIT, H-I-T. I'm just wondering, it, it seems like the same thing. I'm wondering if there's any difference, just to clarify. And then the more important question is, curious about injuries. Um, wonder if you guys see MSTF as something to do only after you've healed from an existing injury. I have a low back injury that I'm, I'm trying to recover from. You see that as like a complement to physical therapy or a replacement to physical therapy, something to do only once you've like solidified the foundation and, you know, um, recovered from any injuries or how do you think about that? Um, so first of all, MSTF is heat, as, it, as, as, as you mentioned. Perhaps it's a little bit more finesse form of it. You know, when uh, I opened my training over eight and a half years ago, it was essentially was heat. I read this book called Body by Science that introduced me. They call it super slow protocol, which is heat, but you move slowly, 10 seconds up, 10 seconds down, you might be familiar with. And then by working with people and realizing that there is much more, it's much more sophisticated, you know, problem than simply because we all have different bodies, different physiological, mental, all those abilities. Uh, and then putting different disciplines together, neuroscience, you know, mindfulness and all that, and kind of evolved in the current version of the MSTF. But the foundation of it is basically hit. Uh, in terms of injuries, uh, it's really injury dependent. Uh, um, you know, you don't want to, for example, when you train, you don't want to uh, work out at the range of motion where you experience pain, you know, like acute pain, uh, staying within, you know, uh, pain-free range of motion. And then, you know, lower back and all that is really case specific. Uh, I would definitely be careful uh, with that and as you, uh, you know, go through your workout because you don't want to make it worse. You want to heal it. Uh, so they, it, it's hard to answer it as I know exactly the nature of it. It's to do, not to do, and all that stuff. Great, thanks. Awesome. Uh, thanks, Luke. And uh, I'll end with a question, but Elo, it looks like you have another question. Do you want to sneak it in? You're, you're on mute. Sorry, I was wondering about um, using like ankle or wrist weights to, to get bigger range of motion. To, is that applicable in MSTF? Can you can you repeat again which weights? Ankle, ankle and wrist. Okay. Yeah. So, so yeah. you get the big range of movement. Mm -hmm. You know, like. Yeah, you, you know, listen. The MSTF was mindful strength training to failure. So the idea is the failure part is uh, as Philip mentioned before. You exhaust your slow twitch fibers, intermediate twitch fibers, and then when you feel that agitation, irritation, you start activating those fast twitch fibers. Once you've activated all the available fast twitch fibers, that's all you can do. Basically, you're gonna guarantee adaptation. So if the weight is very light, um, probably won't work as much because you're gonna go weight long. Like you know, if if you if you go more than three minutes, it's probably too light, right? So. But there's always ways to make it harder. You just, uh, you know, it's a matter of the resistance applied and uh, making those muscles fail 
quote on quote, probably in less than three minutes, more than three minutes, probably too long. The, the, the advantage of the wrist weights is that um, if you get to failure, the weight's not going to fall and do any damage. Um, it's one, it's one difficulty with, with free weights is, you know, if you're doing a chest press to failure and, and you hit failure and it, it, you know, there's a likelihood of it falling on you. So at least with the wrist rate weights, that's not a problem. And this is, by the way, the reason we didn't, uh, cover the free weights in the book, just because stay away from potential injuries. Jean, you had your hand up. You have a question. Yeah, hi, um, uh, Philip. Hello. From many years ago, uh, we met back in our younger theater days, and congratulations oh. on you know the work that you did subsequently in theater and and uh, in uh, you know your. This has been a very interesting discussion, and based on the books you've written, I guess. So, uh, just want to say hi, and I, I will investigate this uh, system further for myself too, and. Um, Good to see you again after all these it's years. It's wonderful to see you, Gene. What a what a lovely reconnection. Thank you for that. Long ago. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, kind of connecting at the the store. Um, yeah. So we have about seven minutes. Maybe I'll sneak in one last question uh, to you, Philip, um, about your uh, work at Embodied uh, Presence Process, because um, we're we're big here on uh, embodiment at the store. In our wisdom gym, we have like an embodiment hour every Thursday at 12, where we watch a cultural prompt and we do embodiment exercises and and, and uh, use it as a forcing function for that. But uh, yeah, I'm curious to learn more uh, for like the, maybe the next couple of minutes, you can just uh, let us know what, what that's about. Yeah, I'd be happy to. Um, when we talk about embodiment, um, I have a particular take on that. Uh, we are, we are mired in a cultural paradigm that for my money began with Parmenides. And when he, you know, when he made that, that bold statement on which basically Western philosophy has been posited, don't trust the senses. They will deceive you. Only reason can lead you to the truth. And that was 500 BC when he made that statement. And, and then, you know, Plato by 350 BC is saying the, how did the gods make us? This is in the dialogue Timaeus. Well, first they fashioned this divine sphere based on the heavenly orbs above. And then they realized it needed a vehicle. So they grew at arms and legs and a trunk so it could get around. Um, that's a long, long period of time to be living in disembodiment and so when we strive to become embodied um we very often reach for means that are actually more deeply entrenching the paradigm rather than moving us past it so for example to urge someone to listen to your body is seeming like you're encouraging embodiment but the metaphor listen to your body it's saying look at your head is in is in one room and your body's next door and the best you can do is to put your ear to the wall separating you from it it, it, it so it's 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 establishing a wall where there is none um and you know when i talk about embodiment there's this long long history that you can trace through language and art whereby in the late Paleolithic, early Neolithic, we experienced our thinking in the belly. And there's an archaeologist, Maria Gimbutash, who, who pointedly points out that, that, you know, we have headstones that mark the, the, where, where the self is buried. And in the early Neolithic, they had navel stones, which is sort of reminiscent of that, um, the, the um, Mayan culture that that has Cusco as the, the the capital, you know, our our word capital means head. So, you know, capitalism is headism. The capital of of the country is the head of the country, and and it's just rife. So, so embodiment goes back to that understanding that every cell in the body 
participates in our thinking. Mind is not a product of the brain and the cranium. Mind is a product of the whole of our being in concert with the present. So I don't see any separation that is possible between mind and the present. And to allow the center of your awareness to soften and drop down into the body, you are reversing 10,000 years in, in, the, in the evolution of our consciousness that took us higher and higher and higher. Even today, you know, we're urging, raise your consciousness. Well, where is it going to, it's going to leave the body altogether if it goes any higher. We, we live in our heads. We live stuck to the underside of our scalps. Um, so occasionally I'll give a talk that, that, that uh, I'll call lower your consciousness because we have lost our community with the earth. We, we don't know what it is any longer to rest in the body, on the earth, in the present. And that takes the whole of your being. And I think the primary wound with which we are all inflicted is the separation of our thinking from our being. These are one thing. And, and if you go back to the Latin root sentire, which means to think, to feel, it's one thing. And our word sense comes from sentire. So, you know, I might say, um, you know, I sense something's wrong, and it means I feel something's wrong. Or I might say, you're not making sense, and I'm saying your thinking is muddled. So there's, you know, feeling and thinking are still shadowed in this world, in this word, but we have been sat in a public school system that says you will get in trouble if you don't suppress the energy of your body and the energy of your body and the intelligence of your body they are inseparable and meanwhile you're you're encouraged and rewarded if you can fill your head with the right ideas and the right facts and what happens is we emerge from that system believing that we can think more clearly with a fragment of our intelligence than we can with the whole of our being. And so a lot of my work is about what does it mean to think with the whole of your being. And when I talk about your being, I'm not talking about what is contained within the envelope of your skin. Your being is, is sort of impeccably, seamlessly woven into the present. Your being is what you discover when you're fully present. Sorry, that's a bit of a rant. I didn't mean to rant. <laughs> Ranting is okay here at the store. And there was okay. a very... I, get ex I get excited when it comes to embodiment. It might show. It was a very embodied rant as well. Um, but uh, yeah, I would love to um, have you come back, Philip, and perhaps a session on uh, um, the embodiment process uh, that you offer. And his website is pretty awesome. I'm loving his glossary, so you can check that out. Um, but we will uh, close here. Um, any any kind of closing thoughts uh, on your end, uh, Andre or Philip, uh, before we uh, wrap up today's session? Well, in terms of embodiment, um, you know, I took several of Philip's weekend workshops, including like long retreats, several days long. Um, yeah, it's it's priceless. If you and it's not intellectual exercise. Once you experience it firsthand. And you reconnect with that being, uh, it's there is no there is no price in it. So I would you know, <laughs> don't just get them into your event and to talk about it. Like asking to put you some you know practices so you can feel it. Uh, and as far as the book, the fitness, um, you know, we are here. Uh, uh, my company, New Element Training. Anybody can go on it, and you know, some more information there. There's the book. Uh, if somebody is in Toronto, they can come and we offer free trials. Oh, we'd also do virtual training, you know, just from my perspective, if somebody must, uh, needs, needs wants more help. Yeah, and there's also, um, we should mention the membership, Andre, that there, there's mm -hmm. a, uh, we, we made um, videos uh, demonstrating every single exercise in the book and what is it $10 a month or something yeah, to... it's like nine something a month. yeah so and you so... can cancel anytime you want to 
Yeah, um, so that that's a resource that people could go to just to to see how it's done. It makes such a difference to actually see it in motion. And that's on Andre's website, New Element Training. So I'll include uh, all the links uh, for those watching on the YouTube channel. And uh, and I love it like that. I just found out that uh, Philip and Andre are in Toronto um, after I reached out to them. So uh, we might have some in-person sessions. Uh, mm -hmm. that, uh, yeah. you know. so There's nothing like, like it. Yeah. yeah, I actually went to U of T, so I have a you know, uh, connection to it. And in one of our locations, literally on Prince Arthur, just north of Blue. Beautiful, beautiful. North of the FT. We used to host uh, before the... COVID, we used to host all our events at the university. Um, so I'll make some closing announcements in a moment, but uh, Philip, Andre, thank you so much for okay. coming. Thank project. you for having us. Such a yeah. pleasure. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. Warm regards. And uh, one the session we have uh, tonight is uh, at 6 p.m. Eastern time, uh, security mindset. So if you want to um, kind of step up your security game on your computer, um, you know, privacy, all that good stuff, feel free to check out that session. Um, that being said, everyone, thanks so much for coming to the store today.